Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Nash, uh, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. Just want to say thank you all so much for coming over here. I love this Catalyst space, um, and I love this lecture series. I love the fact that the dogs are sitting in the front row. Um, and I also love the fact that kids are here. Um, it adds a totally different vibe into a speaker's um, session in which we have to deal with difficult and scholarly topics and all that kind of stuff. No, the world is made richer when kids are around. Um, and so I was just talking with some of the guys over there. Not only are they enjoying the food, but they're actually learning some new cheeses and meats and things like that. And it's an educational experience, doggone it. That's why we come together as social primates to do this. So um, I am thrilled by, by the fact that you all are here joining us today. How many of you here were last month for Ari Barillo's fantastic talk? A whole bunch of you. So um, because Ari did such a good job last month, I'm going to do a public service announcement for him real quick. In a week and a half, on the 23rd and 24th of this month, he's going to be leading some walk and talk um, exercises at the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area. Um, and so Ari, stand up here and just identify yourself. If you didn't see his lecture, it's videotaped. Victoria did a fantastic job with the video. It's on our website. But if you're interested in going on that walk and talk, see that guy. It's going to be a blast. All right, Dr. Lori Webster tonight. Lori Webster and I were in graduate school together here in Tucson at the University of Arizona. We both graduated in 1997, the year that the University of Arizona basketball team won the national championship. <laughs> It made those graduation parties slightly different. Uh, but I've known Lori for a very, very long time. When I was at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, we opened a brand new, wonderful um, collections area, state-of-the-art collections storage area. And I needed a project to demonstrate to the taxpayers, to the administration, to everybody, how important it was to have a state-of-the-art collections facility in that building. And we started thinking about the collections and which ones might epitomize the excellence of that facility. And we went straight to Navajo textiles, Diné textiles. And I called up Lori, who's an ex expert on textiles, and said, hey, Lori, what would happen if we did a book on these textiles? How, how would you do it? And she immediately said, I would collaborate with D.Y. Begay, Linda Teller-Pete, and Louise Stiver. And together, those four ladies came to the museum, looked at 400 textiles, and then picked the 75 best, and then co-wrote this wonderful book on the, these textiles. And amazingly, she got it published in three years. Books don't come out in three years. Um, I tried to find my copy of it. It's still boxed up in bankers' boxes somewhere, so I apologize for that. Um, anyway, we're in the presence of archaeological royalty tonight. Dr. Lori Webster is one of the recognized experts on archaeological textiles and other perishables. So please give a warm Archaeology Southwest welcome to Dr. Lori Webster. <laughs> Well, I paid Steve to say that, <laughs> so um, it's, well, it's wonderful to be back in Tucson, and it's kind of a trip to be back in the Tucson Mall, because I have not been in the Tucson Mall for a really long time. So um, I want to thank Archaeology Southwest, Ari Brio, who put together a um, lecture series, and we're going to have, talk about a pretty obscure topic tonight which is how people wove textiles made from the hair of white dogs. So we'll get, go ahead and get started. Um, so we're going to take a journey um, through the northern southwest. This is a tradition that started about 2,000 years ago and lasted 1,000 years. Um, it's focused on the weaving of white dog hair. And this is right before the introduction of white cotton from Mexico. The textiles were woven with fingers, we call it finger weaving, um, before the introduction of the loom technology from Mexico. And with the other two other major early textile fibers in the northern southwest, which was yucca and human hair, the weaving and spinning of dog hair was almost certainly the work of women. So we're going to be hearing about their work and just getting a feel for you know, what, is, what has survived in the southwest from these periods. So I'm going to start by um, talking about collections from southeastern Utah. And this is because I've been working on a project called the Cedar Mesa Perishables Project for the last um, 10 plus years. And we've been working with collections that were made in south, southeast Utah during the 1890s. 
And they were all made from alcoves. The only place you're going to get textiles preserved is in caves or alcoves. And um, there were about 4,000 uh, textiles, baskets, wooden implements, hides, and items that came out of these caves during the 1890s. And for the last over a decade, I've been working on a project to document these, these textiles. And I just want to give you a little idea of when, when you're seeing things um, attributed. Um, this is the area we worked in. And um, here's Grand Gulch. You're going to see Grand Gulch mentioned. But the collections we worked with go all the way over to the Colorado River on the east side. So it's, it's the canyons that came into the um, Colorado River, which is now inundated by Lake Powell, um, from the east. So you're going to see, I'm going to talk about collections from Grand Gulch, other ones over just west of Blanding, and then other ones by, over by um, the Colorado River. And I just want to give a shout out to my, my project team, which is, um, we have folks from all different backgrounds, scholars in different specialties. And so this is our group. And we've been working to document all these collections um, from this area. So as we were working with these collections, I kept finding objects that were made of white animal hair. And I, I thought they might be white dog hair, but I wasn't sure. So um, yeah, here's some examples. And I'll be talking about these. There's a corn husk full of a sample of white hair, um, a rope that's made of this white hair. I'm going to call it hair now, but all of these have been identified as dog. Um, there's one of several bundles of yarn that were spun from this hair, and then a, a braided band or sash that was made from the spun yarn of this hair. So we kept seeing things like this. And I'm like, you know, I really want to find out, is this really dog or not? And so um, I did two studies um, as part of this project. One was a radiocarbon dating study. We um, radiocarbon dated 103 artifacts from three different museums, the American Museum of Natural History, the Penn Museum, and the Field Museum. And there, for those of you nerds in the audience who are interested in sort of the specifics of um, radiocarbon dating, just shows the labs that were used uh, to process ours. And then at the bottom of this slide, I'm going to be talking about three archaeological periods in the Southwest, known as Basket Maker II, which is about 400 um, BCE to 500 CE. And if you're not familiar with the CE and BCE, it's basically BC and AD. It's just the way we're expressing that now. Uh, Basket Maker three, about 500 to 700 CE, and then Pueblo one, 700 to 900. And these are the periods that dog hair was used in the Southwest. As part of um, our project, we also did some fiber analysis. Um, I sent 14 samples to a retired US and Fish and Wildlife forensic scientist. Her name was Bonnie Yates. And she did the microscopic analysis for us. Um, of the 14, I selected 10 that I thought were probably dog or possibly dog hair. And six of those were identified as definitely white dog hair. We have an, one that's the paw of a light colored dog. And um, another one she identified as dark brown dog hair, which is definitely in the minority of these. And then the two tan brown samples, I thought, oh, I wonder if they're using brown dog hair to weave these bands, they're identifi unidentifiable. So I don't know what those are. So I'm going to uh, start out this talk by just talking about the ones from Southeast Utah, where we have good radiocarbon dates and we have good fiber identifications. So these are all part of our, uh, our project from Southeast Utah. We have a dog hair band on the left. These are median um, radiocarbon dates. It means kind of an average. It's just easier to talk about that than to talk about the span. So there's one from about 200 CE. There's one from the mid 100 CE. And one I didn't date, but that one was identified. The fiber was identified as white dog. And the weave structures of these, you're going to see that 2 slash 2 on here. That's the weave structure of these bands. So it's over 2, under 2. And all everything I'm going to talk about that's a white dog hair band is all woven in over two under two. We also have this rope. I ran across this rope in the collections at the American Museum of Natural History. 
Um, it's about 26 feet long. Um, it's a four strands, and you can see the beautiful long white straight fiber on this. So it's a four strand band. And the important thing to note here is that the way they wove this is all the white dog hair fiber is wound around a yucca fiber core. And so that's how they sort of made it strong enough to braid it. But as I go through these slides, you're gonna say, oh, there's a theme here. They're all, bra everything's braided. This is one that's really similar. Back in the, um, I guess about eight years ago, I worked on a project for the BLM when they were processing collections that had been recovered during a big pot hunting um, case in Utah. And this is one of the items that was recovered. And it's another example of one of those four strand dog hair bands. And this one's now at Edge of the Cedars Museum. And I think last time I was there, it was on display. So the only brown dog hair that was identified by the fiber analyst was from this object. And this is a tump band. It's, a, it's like a, a, a band that's woven or worn around the forehead and attached to like a basket or some sort of heavy load on the back. So it's for supporting, it's a carrying band. And so the only brown dog hair definitely identified in my very small sample was from this. And the, the weaving is not super fine. And as you're gonna see, the weaving of the white dog hair is pretty spectacular. So um, these slides I'm showing you are, are in chronological order. So here we have one from the 700s. It's this big bundle of this beautiful white dog hair in a corn husk container. And whether it was something that someone was just using to, to save the dog hair, or if it was some sort of an offering, we really don't know. We don't have good context for this. This one's from Glen Canyon over on the Colorado River. But you can get a, a feel for the silkiness and straightness of this hair. And then I ran across these three beautifully spun balls of white animal hair yarn. And I have not, I, look, I found these before we did our fiber study, so I haven't analyzed, had them analyzed, but I have no doubt in my mind that they're white dog hair. And the one on the left is single ply. So those of you who are interested in textiles, you can see it's a single ply Z spun yarn. And the middle um, one and the one on the right are the um, are two ply, so they've been plied. And then um, here's the bag. The, these three balls of yarn were found in here, and these are exactly the kinds of yarns when you're gonna in a minute you're gonna see in this, these incredible braided sashes from um, Canyon de Chelly area, and it looks like these yarns were 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 spun to make braided sashes like that. And I do have radiocarbon dates on these, so these are from the 800s. So there's the question of spinning. Uh, most of us think of a spindle as something that's round, either wood or a potsherd, that has a hole in it and a stick goes through it. And those kinds of spindles don't show up in the Southwest until cotton comes into the Southwest. They're coming up from, from Mesoamerica, basically, that technology. And so, Kate Peckent, a textile uh, specialist, um, she had published this picture on the, on the left. And this is a bundle of human hair that was partially spun, and it had this, this cross piece of wood in it. And it's just two pieces of wood that were lashed together, probably with a, a yucca leaf, that if I found that by itself in a site, I would never think, oh, that's a spindle. But the fact that this is, this is stuck in with the half partially spun hair is a really good indication that this is the kind of spindle they were using prehistorically. And it's the kind of thing that you're hardly going to identify prehistorically. And on the right is a picture of someone using this. And so you would have the uh, one or two strands of yarn attached here and just let that go and spin. And so it's basically a drop spindle, but not recognizable as a spindle in most cases. But this is probably how they are spinning the dog hair, because this is how they're spinning human hair, which is the other really important animal hair during this period. So I talked about, um, what I just talked about is our, our, our archeological finds here from Southeast Utah, north of the San Juan River. Now I'm gonna talk about 
what we have in terms of dog hair south of the San Juan River. And this is all in the Four Corners area. So Prairie Rock and Canyon de Chez, Canyon del Muerto, I know probably a lot of you have been to Canyon de Chez National Monument. The Prairie Rock District is on the east side of the Luca Chucay Mountains that kind of separate New Mexico and um, New Mexico and Arizona. And it's just west of Shiprock. So if you know where Shiprock is, the Prairie Rock is it's just west of Shiprock, but it's in Arizona. And this was an area, uh, as far as I can tell prehistorically, this is where the best weavers lived. The really wonderful weaving traditions in the Southwest are coming from, from this area. And so the most famous dog hair textiles are these six pristine, they're absolutely in perfect condition, braided sashes that were found tied together in a bundle from Obelisk Cave, which is in the Prairie Rock District, northeastern Arizona, with a radiocarbon or a yeah radiocarbon date about eight in the 800s. And there's six sashes. In the old days, when I first started going up to Mesa Verde National Park, they were all exhibited together on these tree limbs, and you could see the whole assemblage. But then a decision was made to disperse these to different museums where Earl Morris had worked and his collections went. And one of those uh, museums is University of Colorado <clears throat> in Boulder. So these two of these went there. So there's a white, pure white one and a pure brown one. Two here are here in Tucson at the Arizona State Museum. One is pure white and one has almost a little plaid kind of design on it. And then two are at Mesa Verde and I don't have pictures of those. These are some of the most spectacular pre-contact period you, textiles you can imagine. You look at them and you're like, okay, this, these are 1,200 years old and they're in perfect condition and they're absolutely beautiful and they're really finely spun. So I'm gonna just focus in on these ones that are at Arizona State Museum. So at one time there was a conservator named Rachel Freer Waters who worked at ASM and she got interested in these sashes and she radiocarbon dated the white one and it yielded a date, and this is the whole span, uh, 769 to 905 CE at 95% probability. So that date falls within that time period, and we can just say a median in the 800s. The important thing is she also did a microscopic analysis of um, the white yarns in this one, and she realized the yarns going in one direction were all white dog hair, and the ones going in the other direction are all white cotton. Now, cotton is coming up from Mesoamerica. It's not really common in the Southwest at this time. It's probably been traded in, and somebody decided to put this very special fiber into this one sash. So this is our earliest directly dated cotton in the Southwest, or Northern Southwest, and it foreshadows the replacement of white dog hair by white cotton, which is what happens with white cotton sashes. By the 10 hundreds, all the white cotton sashes are cotton and dog hairs disappeared. Uh, this is another white dog hair sash, also from the Prairie Rock, west of Ship Rock. Um, much simpler, a little coarser, probably some place between 650 and 850 AD or CE. So again, last bit, late Basker Maker three, Pueblo one period. Over by Canyon de Chez, you also have these amazing tapestry woven bands and they're using the white dog hair for the white fiber. And the reason we know this part used to be hair is because beetles like to eat hair. Anybody who has like Navajo rugs or whatever, you know, moths and beetles, they like to eat the proteinaceous fiber. They don't, they don't care at all about cellulose. <laughs> and so all these warp elements here are yucca. That's yucca and everything that's missing was a proteinaceous fiber. And it looks like, and it's all white. So I'm pretty sure this was all white dog hair. And then on this one, you can see those little beetle holes. They've been eating that white fiber, and I'm sure this is an animal hair fiber as well. So they were using the dog hair as white when they were doing tapestry woven uh, textiles in the late basket maker period. Okay, we're gonna to move to the west a little bit, over to the um, 
We just looked at Prayer Rock and Canyon de Chelly. Now we're moving over to the Kanta area, Sagi Canyon. I'm just listing things here because almost everything that I would have shown is funerary, and we're not showing any funerary objects in this presentation. So they talk about the use of dog hair string over there. There's a pouch that's made of a dog skin. A twine blanket. This is a twine blanket, and I'm using a modern Hopi one to show you what these are like. Um, that had a border of white dog hair. They talk about uh, dog hair being incorporated into fur blankets. Just north of this area in Grand Gulch on the north side, I didn't mention this before, but um, just north of the river, there was a, a very high status woman that was associated with a twine blanket and all of the fur on that blanket was white dog hair. And that, that has been repatriated. I, mean, I can't show you a picture, but based on the baskets with her, she dated about 250 CE. They were making some really fancy blankets out of dog hair. Okay, we're gonna go over to Kanab, which is way over west of, sort of, you know, western Utah. Um, there's another braided uh, sash here. This one, I think the white is probably white dog hair. Again, we haven't had anybody specifically look at that and identify the white, but I'm pretty confident that's white dog hair. And the brown is, is human hair, and that was the usual combination. If they're gonna decorate those white, white sashes with some sort of zigzag design or diamond, the brown will be do, uh, human hair and the white will be dog. And then over there, they found this really big bundle. This thing's like this big. Uh, it's a net that's full of white hair. And in the report, it's identified as mountain goat. But I did a little bit of research on mountain goats, and it sounds like mountain goats weren't introduced into Utah and Colorado until the early 1900s for hunting. Before then, they're up in British Columbia, they're in Washington, Idaho, Montana. So I really don't think this is mountain goat hair. Uh, I think if we were to have this analyzed, we would find that it is uh, white dog hair, and here's just some close-ups of the pictures at the Smithsonian of what's in that bundle. You can see how straight it is. It's just this beautiful, beautiful hair. Okay, over to Durango. That's on the east side of what we refer to as the San Juan Basket Maker area. Again, we've got a, a white sash. Sort of the decoration on it is human hair. In the literature, it's identified as rabbit. But when I look at the sort of the distribution of all these others. I suspect it's really dog, white dog. This one was associated with a male adolescent. Most of the ones I've showed you, we don't know that they have any sort of funerary association. This one um, has been repatriated and um, it was associated with a young male. Okay, so we've been looking up here on the Colorado Plateau. We've seen that the use of dog hair goes all the way from the west to the east during this really early period we call Basket Maker II, which would, is probably around AD 1 to 400 or CE. And then I put in this little arrow because I didn't have a map that went all the way down. If we go down 100 miles south, there's a site called Tularosa Cave. And it's, that is down um, in southwest New Mexico. And there, there was a, a man who was um, found wearing one of these sashes. And the, here's a picture of the sash. And from, it's identified as a dog hair sash. And from the, um, the drawing, it looks like it's over two under two like all the others. So that's the only one we know of that's south of the Mogollon Rim. So the takeaways so far, during this early Basket Maker II period, about say one to 400 CE, all across the Northern Southwest, people began harvesting the hair of white dogs for textile production. And this hair was used to make very special articles of clothing. We're not finding all sorts of things made out of dog hair. It's usually the braided sashes, and then the sort of the white highlights in tapestry. And then from about 101 to 900 CE, we know that people collected white dog hair, worked it into thick, four strand ropes, spun it into fine yarn, and used it to make two two twill bladed, braided sashes. The two we have from known funerary contacts were associated with males. 
and this suggests that these sashes were primarily worn by men. And we have one white hair um, twine blanket that was, a, that was associated with a high status woman. I'm kind of thinking of these as ceremonial kinds of clothing. The production of white dog hair sashes persisted into late Pueblo I period, so till 9 to 1000 AD. And then after the introduction of cotton, when it became more common in the Southwest, the fiber in white braided sashes shifted from white hair, dog hair to cotton. And the braided sash from the Prairie Rock district that I, that I discussed with you, containing both white dog hair and cotton, illustrates the beginning of this transition. And the odds of finding one that had both fibers in it, that's pretty amazing that, that uh, Rachel did that study and, and found that. Okay, so we've talked about hair. What about the dogs? And here I'll just do a shout out to an earlier edition of Archaeology Southwest magazine that focused on dogs in the Southwest. And we're in the process of putting together another issue. Ralph's, uh, I guess, the editor for that. And that'll bring in more recent research. If you're interested in um, sort of the history of the archaeology of dogs in the Southwest, I'm not a zoologist. I look at fiber. I don't look like bo I don't look at bones. So, but this is a great place to start if you're interested. And this issue is available online. It's a PDF online, so you can find it. Great articles in there. So I'm not really going to talk about the zoology of dogs. So we have hundreds of archaeological examples of dog bones in the Southwest, of dog burials. There's a lot of dog burials in the Southwest. But the only time you're going to know what color their fur was is if you have a mummified dog. Otherwise, if you just have the bones, you don't know what color that dog is. So for the most part, for most of the dog remains in the Southwest, no one knows what color they were. So there's a cave up in uh, northeastern Arizona near Kayenta. This is the type site for Basket Maker 2 occupation, and it's known as White Dog Cave. And there were two dog, mummified dogs, found in that, that site. The light-colored one is at the top, and there was a little smaller terrier one at the bottom. And um, a zoologist back in 1921, a zoologist studied that dog. He says the larger dog is a long-haired animal the size of a small collie. The hair is still in good condition, and now a light golden color. It's apparently a breed very similar to the long-haired Inca dog found at Ancon, Peru, um, in a mummified condition, which is also described as yellowish in color. That may not mean anything, but that's what the guy said. <laughs> but this is a pelt I found when I was going through the drawers of the Smithsonian. These are dog pelts. This is what the dogs, this is the kind of hair they had. This is what their pelts look like. And these were beautiful Samoyed looking like dogs. And the nice thing about this is it's really hard to do DNA analysis on hair because hair is really dead cells. You need the follicle. But when you have archaeological remains like this, the follicle is there at the end of that fiber. So these, these um, hold some potential for doing some DNA analysis on that hair. But it gives you an idea of how beautiful these dogs were. They're gorgeous. So the question is, did Basket Maker and early Pueblo people, were they breeding white woolly dogs for their hair? Were they intentionally breeding these dogs? A number of North American tribes hold, held, white, or hold, held white dogs in special regard and venerated them in their religious practices. White dogs had special meaning, for, at least for some Native American groups. Um, anyone who's driven on the Navajo Reservation and seen lots of um, sort of free-ranging dogs, um, you're not going to see a pure white dog very often, right? Um, it takes an effort to get a white dog. So white dog hair is carried by a recessive gene, and each of the parents has to carry one or more copies of that gene to produce white offspring. And Few free-ranging dogs are white, so white dogs have to be isolated to create more white dogs. And so um, for this, I looked to um, the Salish. There's a story about the Salish. And if you come next month to Archaeology Cafe, a woman's going to talk about the breeding of the Salish dogs. So for at least 5,000 years, people, Salish people bred and cared for white woolly dogs. The dogs were isolated on islands or in gated pens, 
to control their breeding. They were sheared annually, just like sheep. We have some good reports from some of the early um, sort of European explorers that came to the Northwest and they talk about this. They sheared the dogs, and then the white hair was used to weave special blankets and ceremonial or high status um, items. The caregivers and weavers were women, and dogs served as a source of wealth for those women. And if you look uh, down here, this is a painting, uh, one of the early um, uh, Anglo people that came through in the 1840s painted this. There's one of their little white woolly dogs, and she's incorporating white dog hair into uh, textile. So the Salish is one possible analog, but the one I'm really interested in is the idea of turkey husbandry. We know that turkeys uh, were first domesticated in the northern southwest by 100 CE. Our radiocarbon dates on the sashes say that people are weaving white dog hair sashes by 100 CE. Turkeys are domesticated for their feathers. These dogs are probably domesticated for their hair. Feathers were used in twine blankets and ceremonial paraphernalia. We know that hair was used in some twine blankets and to make high status ceremonial regalia such as these beautiful sashes. There are ritual turkey burials in the Southwest and the white dog cave burial. Um, you have to see that as a ritual burial because those dogs, the dog was buried under these beautiful baskets. Neither animal served as a source of food. Carbon isotope analysis indicates the, the turkeys were fed a diet of corn. Uh, Rachel had done carbon isotope analysis of the hair from one of those braided sashes and found that it indicated a diet of corn. So it seems like these animals are being fed corn, um, just like we give our dog and cats cat food, right? They're getting speci a speci specific diet the turkeys are kept in pens, and then the question is, were dogs, white dogs kept in alcoves or pens to control their breeding? So I think it's a pretty good analog. Um, I'd like to you know, pursue that a little more, but um, it makes sense to me that we have this pattern. There's this sort of high status material, turkey feathers, white hair, and that people are, are following um, a similar practice to, to uh, breed those those animals. And what I didn't put here is um, it's thought that women um, were the turkey keepers in Pueblo society. And maybe that is true also in Pueblo society, just like it was up in the, in the Northwest. So that's it. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so, so much. I am going to open the floor to questions for Lori. Uh, Lori, can you say a little more about the context of the two over, two under weaving pattern? Does where that does, that, in, where in, does it come from? Or, or just, does it occur in more than these sashes that you're talking about? There are, it's kind of an interesting pattern on the Colorado Plateau. All of the sashes are over two, under two. When you get down below the Mogollon Rim, they're three, three. Um, so there, there were different sort of cultural, cultural patterns on a broad scale. Um, but, you know, there aren't that many late archaic textiles out there, and there's nothing that looks like these sashes. And I think the ones in the Northwest are tutu. Um, you know, I haven't looked in that, into that very much, but, yeah, it's definitely a cultural pattern of, you know, how you learn to do things. And so all the ones I showed you here are all two, too. Other questions? I've done some braiding, but I didn't quite follow. They started out with the yucca core, and they were weaving around it. That's only for those ropes. Just the ropes. The sashes are just this beautiful, they're, they're like braiding. my balls they're of yarn that are woven. pure, pure yeah. hair. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I think it's because the ropes had, you know, the, they needed the tensile strength. And a friend of mine who works with Northwest Coast Textiles tells me that when they were weaving dog hair around um, up there, they sometimes mixed it with uh, cedar bark. So I'd like to do a little more research on possible connections with the Northwest. Yeah. 
I used to belong to the Hand Weavers Guild in Tucson, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a lot of talk about the crimp in the fiber as, as making it easier to weave, and yet every hair that I looked at was very, very straight. How did they get it to conform? Is it twisted really, really tightly? I've never done any experiments, so I don't really know. It's not twisted all that tightly. Um, I mean, obviously they all have scale patterns. Hair has a scale patterns on it, and that helps the fibers stick together. But I know like milkweed won't stick together very well, but I think hair does. But I haven't done anything because I'm not a spinner, actually. Well, this, uh, one of the women in the guild decided to use dog hair to mm -hmm. make a hat. And uh, she had a very good time at it. Uh, she said the big drawback was that if it was moist out that day, you smelled like your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've heard a lot of stories of people making, um, sort of collecting all their dog hair and giving it to, to a spinner and having them make a sweater for them or something. <laughs> It's wool. Dog hair is wool. But it is a beautiful, straight fiber that these people are obviously selecting for. Um, and they wouldn't have selected for it if it wasn't something they could manipulate and weave a nice yarn from. So, yeah. um, hi, hi, Laurie. Um, my question is, several years ago when, <laughs> when my husband and I visited Alaska, we had the opportunity to uh, purchase uh, scarves and things that were woven from the sled dogs in that time. Oh, wow. Did you find in, in your work that there were um, artifacts that you found that were actually the balls of, of dog hairs and that you could confirm that these artifacts were in fact uh, dog hair collections that were Yeah, made. the only one that is like pure dog hair is the one that was in the um, corn husk. And, that's, and then the one in that big bundle that they thought was mountain goat, that's all pure. And looking at it, it looks to me like they are shearing it with a knife, that they're actually shearing those dogs with a knife. Because you, if you look, you can see it's been cut off like in clumps. Yeah. How long was the Probably fiber? Probably five then? or six inches. Wow. It would be like a, like a Samoyed hair. The Northwest dogs, in my uh, limited knowledge, were much, much smaller. The one in the picture is really small. They're little dogs. Yeah. yeah. These are definitely, they're, they call them long hair woolly dogs. It's sort of a type of dog. It's, it's a woolly dog. And um, yeah, that one um, pelt I showed you, that hair is a good three and a half, four inches long. I was interested to know if there was any kind of, I know with the Salish woolly dogs, there's like cultural memory because it lasted up until relatively recently. There's cultural memory of that kind of practice and spinning and whatever. And I wonder if you ran across when you were doing this research, any kind of like modern cultural memory or cultural heritage of spinning dog hair when you were researching this. Do I know like anyone who's alive today that remembers doing, well, I mean, native, native folks? I have not talked to people about it, but no one's done it for a thousand years. Um, none of the native groups in the Southwest have done it for a thousand years. Um, it would be interesting to know if anyone, if that's, the stories have been carried down, but I don't, to my knowledge, know. But I would guess that if we were to talk to native folks um, about the significance of dogs, they might have some idea about that. Um, you know, why dogs are special. You read about how they're sort of guardians. Through a lot of cultures in the world, people are buried with their dogs. And they're thought to be sort of the guardians as you go through the afterlife. Um, but I, don't, I haven't done any research with um, living Native people to ask if they have any information. But if you were to go up to Salish country, there's still a lot of people that talk about it. But that lasted into the, you know, fairly recently. And here, it really seems to have ended a thousand years ago when cotton came in, which is really interesting. And so what is the symbolic 
meaning of white fiber. Yeah. Yeah, just to, to take off on that, to uh, sort of anticipate the next lecture that's coming up in a month, um, the, the one on the Salish woolly dogs that'll be here next, uh, whatever day that is. December 3rd. Thank you, December 3rd, Dr. Audrey Lynn will be here and her talk will be moving up to the Pacific Northwest and that one is uh, ethno, uh, more ethnographic or collaboratively ethnographic. So that I think will address those questions uh, a bit better, at least for that region. So stick around. So I was wondering, do you have any thoughts on like what else people would be doing with these dogs? Do they just keep them for their hair, or do they like help them hunt? Or like I'm just imagining a, a collie, is, or what do you call it? Is it a collie, or what size is the dog? Yeah, it's supposed to be a small collie. Small collie. How small is a small collie? <laughs> uh, is that a where's, collie? La where's Lassie? I don't know if they're going to go. <laughs> what? What else would they be good for? I think they're being bred for their hair. I mean, I'm sure that they, they could do other lots of good things for you, but um, the point is if you're gonna breed white dogs, you're not gonna let them be pals with, with brown dogs. So maybe you're not gonna take them out hunting and let them run around. It sounds like, you know, based at least on the analog for the um, Salish, they are specifically keeping, they keep them on islands up there. And so you are segregating these animals with the idea of breeding these animals. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't, weren't treated in certain very special ways. I think if we had more information about, I know that a lot of research has been done on dog burials, but we never know which one's white and which one's not. Um, but they were treated in, in special ways and, and also sacrificed a lot um, prehistorically in the Southwest. So, yeah, I mean, if. I guess they would keep the rodent population down in the cave they were, they were segregated in. But I think, it's, I think there was something special about those animals. They were probably treated very specially, and they were kept for their fur, their hair. That's, that's my take on it. OK, we have time for two more questions. One. I, I just have one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I have just one real quick question. Um, so you're finding that uh, human hair and the dog hair, do you ever see gray human hair being used in? Gray, he, gray like human hair? Like what people have got, like older folks with gray hair, like as white in anything? I have seen bundles of gray human hair that are now treated as human remains. Um, but I've never seen it used as a weaving element. Yeah. Whereas brown human hair, there's three important early fibers in the Southwest, yucca, human hair, and white dog hair. And white dog hair is probably the least common. Yucca is the most common, but human hair was used a lot. And it's used for its tensile strength. In some weavings, it's used as a color contrast. Um, but it was very commonly used until Probably about the same time as when dog hair disappears. Did they ever find or did you ever see that they found any tools or uh, cutting implements to actually do the shearing of the white dogs? Well, there's stone knives. I assume that would work for cutting dog hair. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that for sure. So many of the, the items that we worked with on our perishables project had very poor documentation. So it's not like, you know, these were all excavated in the 1890s. We don't have a lot of information about what was associated with different things. So we just don't have that information. Okay, this is our last question. <laughs> yeah, Laurie, great talk. I'm wondering if uh, isotope analysis would has been used to be able to tell whether or not the hair is uh, coming from dogs that are bred locally, or if it's the hair that's being traded? Well, we've got the dog mummies and the pelts, but it's a good question. And good old Mar Martin Welker's here, and he's a zooarchaeologist. So um, he would know more about that than me. I really just, I'm looking just at the fiber evidence. 
but um, we've been chatting, and it'd be really fun to sort of take this to the next level and, and do things like that. Um, I think the dogs are in the Southwest. You wouldn't have that much. You would see much more, I think, uh, bundles of the hair, like they're being transported. Um, I think the dogs are local. But I don't know that for sure. Okay, one more round of applause for Lori Webster. <laughs>